My pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon's panel. A couple of housekeeping things. Once the discussion between the panelists is concluded, we're going to open up to the floor for questions. Raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. Keep questions concise and in the form of a question. <laughs> yeah. See, you all get it. It'll be, it'll be fine. So it's my pleasure to welcome our, our panelists to the stage. First, Rabbi Dr. Meyer Soloveitchik is rabbi of Congregation Sheriff Israel, New York Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue, the oldest Jewish congregation in the United States. He is also the founder and director of the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought at Yeshiva University. He graduated summa cum laude from the same institution and received his PhD in religion from Princeton University. His podcasts include Bible 365, a daily study of the Hebrew Bible, and Jerusalem 365, which tells the 4,000-year history of Jerusalem. Soloveitchik has testified before the US Congress on the subject of the free exercise of religion, and in 2018 was awarded the Canterbury Medal by the Beckett Fund. Rabbi Soloveitchik. Next, Devor Goldman is a co-director and the editorial mentor of the Krauthammer Fellowship, the Tikva Visiting Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. She is also a contributing editor at Mosaic, Public Discourse, and American Purpose magazines, and was the founding director of Tikva's Legal Fellowship. She has previously worked as a legislative staffer in the Senate and as an editor at National Affairs. Her writing has appeared at the Wall Street Journal, National Affairs, Bloomberg, The New Atlantis, The Weekly Standard, and many other outlets. Please welcome Ms. Goldman. And now the man for whom I would like to continue my employment and will give him, therefore, a good intro. <laughs> you say, it's true man, you say? OK. It's <laughs> terrible. I'm under contract. You can't do anything. <laughs> Carl Truman is a professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College in Pennsylvania and a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington. DC from 2012 to 2018 he was pastor of Cornerstone Presbyterian Church in Ambler, Pennsylvania. In his spare time he runs, listens to rock and classical music and does what his wife tells him. I didn't read this part. <laughs> yeah, all right, we'll go with that. He's also the author of a number of books including perhaps most notably The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which in order to keep me employed you should go buy along with all further books that come out from this this individual. Dr. Drew will be moderating this panel. It's a pleasure to have you all three here. Dr. Truman. You can't get the staff these days, I'm afraid. Uh, it is a, it's a great pleasure to, to be with you all and to moderate this panel this afternoon and a great honor uh, to be on a platform with Devor and, and Solly. I want to thank you personally uh, for coming to, to Grove City College in order to talk about what is a a, a difficult and controversial uh, issue. I think for many of us, October the 7th last year was something of a wake-up call. I think what, what struck me was not the protests, but the timing of the protests. That the streets were filled in America and in, in many European countries with people on October the 7th. Clearly, by the date, uh, not criticizing any kind of Israeli military action, for no military action had taken place at that point, but celebrating the, the rape, uh, murder, and kidnap of, of people simply because uh, they were Jews. And for me personally, I think that was the moment when I realized that anti-Semitism was not the, simply the, uh, the preserve of a, uh, a sort of crazy left-wing anti-Israel fringe, but was actually alive and well in the halls of, of academe and moving to other parts of the political spectrum as well. So what I want to talk about today is uh, background to anti-Semitism in general, ask some specific questions about the context in which we find ourselves at the moment, and then throw it open for questions from, from the audience. But if we can start uh, asking you both, just a very personal question. Uh, you know, has anti-Semitism been a routine part of your experience in America throughout your lives? Or is it something that has perhaps become far more significant, more intense, and more threatening in the last decade? 
first of all, thank you so much. Can, is my mic on? It's working? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's really a privilege to be here. Um, and I would say definitely not. It was not a element, you know, a significant feature of my life. I can't really recall any explicit anti-Semitism that I experienced growing up. I grew up in a very uh, Orthodox Jewish community, a large suburb in New York <laughs> of New York called Lawrence, which is part of the Five Towns, a sort of large Jewish area. Um, and I grew up feeling very American and very Jewish. Um, we would say the Pledge of Allegiance every day in my Jewish day school. We would sing um, the Star Spangled Banner before school presentations, and we would also pray the Jewish prayers every day, and we would celebrate things like Israel's Independence Day. There was very much a feeling that we were proud Zionists and very proud Americans as well. Um, my family would take us on trips to the US, the US um, um, I'm forgetting the term for this ship. Apologies, I'm slightly under the weather, so forgive me if I also sound a little sick, but um, the Intrepid, which is a aircraft carrier. Yes, okay. Um, we would go to visit um, other important historical sites, Williamsburg and so forth, and I felt as American as pretty much any other person I'd met, and um, I, for that reason, was really shocked by everything I saw following October 7th. It felt like the America I knew was either, I had either been deceived to some degree or there was a new element that had taken hold that was inorganic to the American culture I'd come to grow, in, you know, I'd grown up in. Um, and I'm still making sense of it. And, you know, seeing people tear down posters of babies and, you know, toddlers from my neighborhood, which I did see in the Upper West Side in Manhattan, has been uh, quite jarring. And I think that there's a lot to to it, I don't think it's as deeply rooted as you know, kind of genteel anti-Semitism might be in some European countries. But I think that it's. I like to believe that it's a change and not an unmasking, as some people um, are inclined to believe. Um, but that's my initial thoughts. So I, I want to first second uh, what Devora said and to say how uh, privileged I feel to be invited to take part in this conference and really how meaningful. Uh, it, it is uh, that, that you, Dr. Truman, and that uh, Grove thought that this was an important subject uh, to have a conference around. It, it really means the world. Uh, I'll also second what Devorah said in saying that growing up, I experienced no anti-Semitism. I grew up in uh, <laughs> an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood of Chicago, so we have you know, a, a more cloistered Orthodox Jewish neighborhood from New York and an Orthodox Jewish neighbor from Chicago. It's a very diverse panel uh, that Dr. <laughs> Truman uh, has, uh, has put. Finally, a panel that looks like America. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I not only did not experience anti-Semitism really what marked so much of my life and still continues to mark my life in a very great, to a great extent is the experience of philo-Semitism. Uh, and we need to note actually how that is a feature of American history and, and the American Jewish experience that sets the Jewish experience apart in America from really from almost any other diaspora Jewish experience. Uh, and the fact that, and this is something I emphasize to my own students when I teach about Jewish history, Jewish politics, that the fact that we have in America many millions of non-Jews that actually care a great deal about the well-being of the Jewish people, the well-being of the Jewish state, that's utterly unknown to us in the many thousand year history of the Jewish people here and there you will find Gentiles that care about our future, you know, Osiris uh, once in a while. Uh, but that's very rare, and yet I've experienced it personally in ways that impacted me profoundly. Uh, uh, one of my first excursions beyond the Jewish world uh, was in which I grew up, the Jewish neighborhood in which I grew up was when I uh, gave the opening prayer at the Republican convention in 2012. And this was not a very Jewish audience. Uh, uh, and, you know, these are people who, on the one hand, knew very little about the intricacies of Hebrew and Jewish life. When somebody saw me in the room, I was the only person with a yarmulke 
and asked me, hi, who are you? And I said, I'm Mayor Soloveitchik. The question I received was, that's great, of which city are you the mayor? <laughs> uh, uh, but, but when people asked me, you know, what was it like doing this opening prayer? I said, actually, the most impactful thing for me was not speaking to this large audience, to, doing a prayer. It was what happened the rest of the day when people kept coming over to me and just embracing me and saying, God bless you, God bless the Jewish people, God bless Israel. And so it is indeed a new experience for me to experience exactly what Devorah described, to walk home on a Sabbath on the Upper West Side where I live and to see either posters that have been torn down uh, featuring images of captive women and children or to see that they've been taped over so severely in order to prevent uh, them from being torn down. I would just add that, because I think it is connected, that just as I would never have predicted experiencing that in the neighborhood in which I live and really in the city in which I've lived for decades, uh, I've, I've also, I also would not have expected uh, in some of the same circles uh, such open anti-Americanism, uh, which has also uh, grown in a way that I would not have thought possible. Uh, I would not have thought it possible that uh, a story like the 1619 Project, uh, as historically inaccurate as it was and as really anti-American as it was, could receive the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and so these two unpredictable aspects, I think, are linked. Uh, and uh, both are aspects of now American life, at least to some extent, uh, that I, I would not have predicted 10 years ago. If I could add just a little bit to that. Um, first of all, I also want to just double my thanks for the organization of this of this conference, which is very meaningful to me as well. But um, you know, as I sort of exited my Orthodox Jewish world and you know did go work in the Senate and so forth, I'll just echo what Rabbi Soloveitchik is saying that I felt so so welcomed, not just as an American, but as a Jew. I, a lot of people had a very friendly curiosity about, you know, why I was leaving early on Friday for Shabbat or what this weird holiday of Sukkot with the booths meant. And, you know, I would show them Google images and so forth. And there was just a wonderful, um, real, I think, friendship among believers that I felt that it continues to be a very important part of my life and my work at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Um, I think that there is such a important partnership between a or you know, believing Jews and believing Christians, and hopefully I, I would hope more believing Muslims as well. Um, people who are sort of against the worst excesses of the woke world that are attempting to undermine, you know, everything that is stable and traditional and kind of gives meaning to life. Um, so yeah, it was upsetting to see some people on, in that general world turn so abruptly, but on the flip side, I've just had years of wonderful friendships that cross religious religious divides. Yeah, it's very interesting, uh, sorry, is that you connect it to a, a general anti-Americanism. I yeah. find it odd as an immigrant that I have, I, c I clearly have a lot of affection for my old country, but I seem to have more affection for my new country than a lot of people who were born here have. And that strikes me as a very strange thing, a very strange moment in, in American history. It, it is, it, 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 on the one hand, it may seem strange, but the, the interesting aspect of American uh, exceptionalism is that often we can best understand American exceptionalism through the eyes of those who are at least once outsiders uh, to this country. Uh, the best book about American exceptionalism, of course, is Tocqueville. Mm. Uh, the best modern book about American exceptionalism is my late and very much missed friend, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, former chief rabbi of Britain's book about America, or inspired by America, his critique of multiculturalism called The Home We Built Together, mm. uh, which describes why America's, what he calls, covenantal politics, so succeeds in creating unity without dismissing difference. And so often it's through the eyes of an outsider that we can appreciate what makes us special. Uh, and of course now we face from the inside uh, those that seek to um, ahistorically attack what makes America special. Yeah, it's interesting you mention uh, Jonathan Sachs. Uh, um, is it true that you were, I see Wikipedia says that you almost became his replacement. <laughs> <laughs> There's been much that's uh, misreported about that. Uh, it confirms that, uh, my trust in but, uh But he was, uh, it is an incredible position, of course, and, uh, and, and, uh, 
and the impact that he had on yeah. not just Jewish life, but yeah. just the faith itself and the future of faith is is incredible legacy. Yeah. Yes, I would recommend any member of the audience go to the First Things website and uh, search for Jonathan Sachs. You'll find his Erasmus lecture from, I think, 2013, 2014. Well worth, well worth. Creative reading. minorities. Yeah, very well worth reading. Devorah, this one's for you. Uh, now, you uh, shared with me this morning an article you've got forthcoming at Public Discourse with the title, The Conspiracists, which looks at the rise of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories uh, on the right. Uh, earlier this week, I noticed, in fact, it was just yesterday, uh, Sir Abamari, uh, who is uh, an interesting person in and of himself, we were talking about him just before we started, wrote a piece in Britain's New Statesman uh, under the title, The New Racist Right Are Uniquely Dangerous. Uh, both touching on, your articles touching on similar material, and I noticed that uh, uh, Amari's article earned him immediate excoriation on uh, things like Twitter as uh, having gone woke. Uh, what factors do you think explain the, in, the resurfacing in recent days and in what were once perhaps deemed comparatively mainstream and conservative contexts of old style conspiratorial anti-Semitism? I mean, it's interesting to me that, you know, as I say, growing up, I always thought of anti-Semites were the sort of the, the keffier wearing anti-Israel academics, suddenly we seem to be seeing a re-emergence of the old style, conservative European anti-Semitism. What do you think is driving that? Um, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't know that I have the answer. There, I'm sure there, there are many answers. Um, but I think that First of all, actually, Jake Shields, who is also a Twitter personality and a former UFC fighter, and he seems to have become a sort of permanent um, Twitter anti-Semite. That seems to be his job now. Um, he posted something along the lines of, you know, posing this question, if Jews were expelled from so many countries for so many centuries and they've been accused of blood libel so many times, isn't there some, mustn't there be something to that? And that, I think, actually really resonates with people because Jew hatred is so very ancient. And when something is so longstanding, it, I think, has an immediate psychological pull for people. You know, if it's been around for that long, can't we concede there's something to it? Um, and I think that there's, there's a lot of different psychological elements that emerge from that basic premise. Um, because, and here's another thing that I, I just kind of considered. I think that Jews, because they've been around for so long, and they've been involved in so many kind of shady, um, weird theories, weird illusions, I think to some degree, the same way that therapy, if done, especially if done poorly, can kind of place the parent as the person who's, who can kind of craft this who can take the blame for virtually any narrative you want to make of your life. If you're, if you're doing well, if you're doing poorly, if you're doing you know, this wrong thing or that wrong thing, you can kind of tie everything back if you try really hard to something or other your parents did. I think Jews sort of have been around for so very, very long. They're like the parent in some ways of the world. It's sort of like, okay, we can find some way to, tack, to you know, tie this problem in some manner to our parent figure, which is this like very ancient people that seems to pop up everywhere and be successful everywhere and you know, so forth. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot else that, so just to establish that among all the conspiracy theories, anti-Semitism is the first among equals. There are many other conspiracy theories that share elements with anti-Semitism. There, there were a lot of actually quite similar, I would say, conspiracy theories about Masons for a while in the United States, about Jesuits. People thought that Masons were like drinking wine out of skulls and doing all these weird things and becoming, you know, controlling everything in kind of similar ways that people tend to frame Jews as controlling things and doing weird rituals. But Jews have just been around for a long time, so they're, it's very easy to immediately turn to them. Um, but I also think conspiracy theories are very flattering to the believers because they are quick and easy to kind of tap into. And here's one example I would say. Candace Owens posted a tweet uh, in early March, which, in which she posted a photo of a black rapper whose name is Kitty Kudi or something like that. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but um, she posted a photo of this black rapper dressed in a sort of a white lace bridal gown ensemble sort of outfit, holding hands with a designer 
who she did not explicitly say this in the post, but is a Jewish man, and she said, and her the way she framed it was, and they're holding hands, and okay, this is supposed to look weird. There's this black man in a dress with this Jewish designer, and the way she framed it was something like, when I see demonic rituals like this being done to black artists, and then I research who's behind it, in this case, a designer who used to work for, Jew for Woody Allen, I can't fathom why black people think that I'm the enemy. Open your eyes. It was something like that, not verbatim, but something close to that. So the way she frames that, she's posing a challenge to her audience, and it's a flattering challenge. When someone tells you, look at this and connect the dots, they're telling you, you can connect the dots. You can see what I am seeing. And that is a way of flattering your intelligence. You know, you don't have to try very hard. Just look at this picture, do a little research. You can kind of see this guy has a Jewish last name, and you get the picture, right? So it's flattering your intelligence without asking you to do very much work. It's telling you you're part of something, and also you're being let in on something. That is also flattering. Like, I am divulging, disclosing something to you, because I know you're smart enough to get it. And then you feel like you're part of something. Um, and the flip side, and also the way that she put it, that demonic rituals are being done to black men, absolves the black man, in this case, of responsibility. It's not that this black person is doing something transgressive or doing something wrong. This is a ritual being done to him. And by absolving him of responsibility, that's another way of flattering him or flattering the readers. Okay, this is, this is all, all these weird things that you're seeing in the culture, things that might make you uncomfortable, cross-dressing, whatever the case may be. You can kind of tie it along with me to the Jews, and then you can feel like, okay, I get it. It's not my fault. So that is just one small example. There are many, many, many examples all over Twitter like this. But I think um, the reason that it's important is because it reflects the kind of resentment people fe are feeling right now. People feel very out of control. They feel they've been lied to, I think very rightfully so, many times by elites. Um, this might be a little bit out there, but I think transgenderism is a very key example of a lie that medical institutions have buttressed and su supported, even though it seems like it's a supremely obvious lie. Um, and when people feel like they're being so misused, people are having trouble getting married, people are having trouble just getting, you know, buying a house, things like that they think that they should be somewhat entitled to if they just have sort of a friendly, you know, a, a light grip on responsible, responsible behavior. People feel resentful and upset, and the woke left has long appealed to, pe to resentment and people feeling out of control, and now the woke right is doing the same thing. And they both are sort of pivoting towards Jews because it's convenient, it's a readily available source of a long-standing tradition of blaming them, and it's, you know, it's, it's easy to turn to the Jews, um, especially when you can point to a Jewish designer, someone who has a Jewish last name who's in a position of power. You can kind of just show that, oh, the Jews are sort of sprinkled all around, and they've been blamed for a long time, so let's do it. Let's do it again. Sorry. <clears throat> In an article in the Wall Street Journal last November, you, you made the following comment. Uh, Hamas seeks the death of every Jew, a goal stated explicitly in its charter, which asserts as a religious obligation, and you quote, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews, when the Jew will hide behind stones and trees. The stones and trees will say, O oh Muslims, O oh Abdullah, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. End quote, end the quote of your article as well. Uh, why is it that the language of genocide has been so successfully hijacked by those opposing Israel at this point, when it seems that the only people involved in the conflict, wherever you sort of fall on the strategies being deployed, the only people involved in the conflict who are committed to genocide, the elimination of a people simply because they are a certain people, are the Hamas fighters and their Palestinian supporters. Yeah, so here we have to uh, attempt to understand uh, the perversity of anti-Semitism and how it works. And maybe I'll uh, build on what Devorah said by speaking a little about anti-Semitism in general and then using that as an example. So uh, Devorah spoke about both how anti-Semitism has been around a long time, and of course that goes hand in hand with the fact that the Jews have been around for a very long time. And to a great extent, uh, uh, an anti-Semitism, like by the way, philo-Semitism, begins with the question about the Jews, why are they still here? Why are they here? 
uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, somebody asked me about my own faith. Uh, so they often get a little surprised because I begin with citing not a Jewish source, but I quote the Christian writer Walker Percy. And this is really one of my favorite quotes. Uh, and uh, I didn't really have a yearbook. Uh, I went to a, you know, a small Jewish high school and there was like three or four people in my class. Uh, you know, our lacrosse team was amazing though. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but this would have been, this would have been, this would have been, uh, not a lot of Jewish schools have lacrosse teams. So it's a, uh, this, would have been my, this would have been my yearbook quote had I known about it at this point. And he said like this, where are the Hittites? Why does no one find it remarkable that in most world cities today there are Jews, but not one single Hittite, even though the Hittites had a great flourishing civilization while the Jews nearby were a weak and obscure people? When one meets a Jew in New York or New Orleans or Paris or Melbourne, it is remarkable that no one considers the event remarkable. What are they doing here? But it is even more remarkable to wonder if there are Jews here, why are there not Hittites here? Where are the Hittites? Show me one Hittite in New York City. <laughs> That's what he writes. Though, given, I, given you know, some of the people I've met in New York City, if they were Hittites, that would explain a lot, actually. But, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's how this, that is the opening question. What are they doing here? Why are they still here? How is it possible that they are still here? Of course, the, the Jews have an answer to this question. Uh, Philo Semites have an answer to this question. Uh, it begins with a promise made to Abraham and predictions made in the Bible, many of which have already come true, some in our own age. Uh, the anti Semite takes that and turns it on its head. A friend of mine, the young Christian leader Rob Nicholson, uh, has uh, described anti Semitism as a, a hatred of chosenness. And he, as I think these are his words. He says it's. It's, it's the great anti-myth that takes Jews and places the blame on them for all the world's ills. So to the question of why are they still here, it must be, says the anti-Semite, because they're at the heart of such a, con a conspiracy. That's step one. The next step, and this is what Rabbi Sachs pointed out, is what this means, therefore, is that whatever is seen as the embodiment of evil in that age you'll apply that to the Jews. That's what happens next. That's why Jews will be blamed for, in the medieval period, for any host of ills, for the Black Death, for they'll be accused of, of, of blood, there'll be blood libels. Uh, they'll, in the modern age, they'll be accused of, bo of being both voracious capitalists and of being communists. Um, and of course today, What's being applied is accusations of racism, colonialism, uh, and genocide. Of course, if there's been a people that's been the victim in the 20th century uh, and before of racism, genocide, and colonialism, it's the Jews. Uh, if there is any story uh, that is a story of the indigenous people of a region establishing independence over and against colonialism. It's the story of the state of Israel. That is the story of the state of Israel. If there's a story of people that suffer uh, genocide, that's the story of the Jewish people. But that's how anti-Semitism works. It, it takes uh, a term that, at the, that everyone understands, describes a certain evil, in that society, rightly or wrongly, and of course, racism is a great evil and genocide is a great evil, but it then seeks to apply it to the Jews. That's how anti-Semitism actually activates in every, single genera in every single generation, in every single period. Interesting. Do you think, therefore, that you know, one of the, I think, tricky questions that's emerged is, is it possible to, uh, to critique uh, the policies of Israel in the current conflict without rendering oneself vulnerable to accusations of anti-Semitism. Is, is there a sense in which constructive discussion of what's going on, is it being stymied by you're either with us or against us, you're either an anti-Semite or a philo-Semite? Is, is do you see that as a problem at this point? 
So if in the larger question, I think that the larger question I think is, is when is criticism of Israel anti-Semitism and when isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So of course it is possible to criticize the particular, polic particular policies of the state of Israel without being anti-Semitic. A uh, very you know, brief Google search will reveal that I've been very critical of the current policies on the Temple Mount where Jews are not allowed to openly and fully pray and worship. I think that's an injustice, and I've been very open about that. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, in the spirit of both Jewish tradition and democratic values, Jews should be allowed to pray in what is Judaism's holiest site, which is not the Western Wall, but the Temple Mount. I've written any number of articles, but no one's yet accused me of being anti-Semitic, uh, which would be problematic for my career, certainly. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, but what, uh, where you see anti-Semitism being revealed is when critiques are leveled on Israel, A, of course, that are untrue. So you see it's sort of two, two critiques. One is just critiques that are blood libels, uh, in which uh, people rush to assume or are excited to assume the worst about the state of Israel. The uh, exhibit A for that, of course, was when, uh, and I can't even believe I'm using this term, the Gaza Health Ministry, which is, of course, Hamas, uh, announced that uh, Israel had hit a hospital and that 500 people had been killed. And 12 hours later, it was revealed that n n no hospital had been hit, the parking lot had been hit. The missile came from Palestinian Is Islamic Jihad, not from, not from Israel, and that no, nowhere near 500 people were killed. Um, but the New York Times immediately posted this story. Immediately. And you could see, as many noted, they were ex so excited that just a few weeks after October 7th, they were able to turn, turn the tables and turn Israel into, into the violator. So that's one form. And that is essentially, that's, that's, that is, that's a blood libel. And what blood libels do is it takes the symbol of Jewish covenantal vibrancy and attempts to turn it into a symbol of, of evil. So in the medieval period, it was the matzah used at the Passover Seder, the unleavened bread. That's a symbol of Jewish perseverance and endurance and indeed bound up in the original Exodus story. And so that became the target and the story that was born in Norwich in England uh, and then spread around the world uh, was the story that Jews murder uh, uh, Christian children and use the blood to make matzah. Nowadays, of course, the sim one of the, the, the greatest symbol of Jewish vibrancy and endurance is the state of Israel. So it's the target of blood libels. That's one, that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is where you would criticize Israel for something that you would, you would never criticize any other polity. So for example, for example, it is of course a terrible tragedy when innocents are killed uh, in, in, in war. War is hell, of course. And terrible tragedies do happen in war. But when Israel is criticized, let's say, for the death of, of aid workers in a way that America was not criticized when similar accidents happened in, 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 other, in other wars or other countries, so then either those criticisms are themselves motivated by anti-Semitism or those criticisms are giving sucker to anti-Semites. Uh, and uh, when the current administration uh, holds Israel to a certain double standard, I don't think that when the president speaks he's being motivated by anti-Semitism but he is motivated at the time, uh, at the moment, it's sad to say, uh, by, a mem by members of his political coalition who are themselves anti and He's motivated by assuaging members of his political coalition who are, uh, sad to say, anti-Semites. And so you see criticism of Israel linked to anti-Semitism in a variety of different ways, but those are some of the ways in which it reflects itself. But obviously, of course, it's not anti-Semitic to criticize a specific Israeli policy. Um, but, but 
but by and large, um, by and large, um, uh, unfortunately, most criticisms of Israeli policy uh, are, 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 are not of the appropriate kind, let's put it that way. That was very, very powerful and very clear. Thank you very much. Um, just a, one last question before I throw it open for, for audience questions. Uh, questions that you won't have seen in advance, of course. So who knows what's coming your way? Don't tell anybody that we saw these in advance. <laughs> yeah. To sort of end, on a, uh, end this section on a more positive note, uh, what constructive measures, and, and Devorah, you touch on some of these at the end of the article that you showed me this morning, uh, what constructive measures do we as individuals, institutions, and society as a whole need to take to address the the rise of, of this violent anti-Semitism that's beginning to emerge in, in American and Western culture? Um, yeah, so I think that it's, it's tough. It's very tough because if you point out that people are anti-Semites, especially on Twitter, that, on, that is currency for them that will only feed their kind of, it, it'll just give them exactly what they're looking for, more attention, it'll make them the Twitter main character of the day for another a few days. Um, it'll allow them to say that they're being canceled or that they're part of a smear campaign or so forth. Um, so just attacking anti-Semites on the grounds that they're anti-Semites, it seems to me to be a losing strategy in many ways. I think a better way to think about it is trying to understand what some of these very nihilistic actors are appealing to, which is human misery, loneliness, alienation, feeling of lack of control, feeling that you know, even if they wanted to take responsibility for their lives and get married and do all the things that, they're, that they would, might ideally want to do, they're being stymied, feeling that they're being lied to by medical institutions and the government and so forth. Trying to right the ship in America is going to entail long and difficult work, some of which is really being done by people who are trying to correct DEI in, in universities, for example, like Chris Rufo and Ben Sass at the University of Florida and Ron DeSantis. There, there are people doing good and difficult work trying to make our institutions better. But I think one of the, but you know, the people who are red pillars or online anti-Semites, they're not really trying to make things better. They're just appealing to people's worst instincts and worst impulses and without pointing them to a path towards redemption. So if you blame the Jews, maybe you can feel that you're not personally responsible for whatever is causing you personal misery or alienation, but neither do you have a path towards something better. Um, I think that we can just realize that some of the slogans that people like Candace Owens have adopted, America first, Christ is king, these, are, these resonate with people, not necessarily for bad reasons, they're just being employed towards bad ends. So I think that we can realize that we don't have to cede all storytelling capability to the worst elements of the right or the left. Both of, they have both told stories that are compelling stories. I think we should also try to tell stories that are compelling stories. Rabbi Soloveitchik does this very often and very beautifully in the way that he appeals to what is great about America, what is great about religious life. Um, I think we should just kind of keep trying to do that and you know, meet them on the battlefield in that way come up with our own slogans that point people towards more noble or hopeful ends. Um, I mean, maybe I'm naive. That is, I, I can't imagine fighting them by just calling them anti-Semites is gonna fix much, so that's where I would lean towards. I, I would add that, uh, thank you for your kind words, Devara. Uh, I, I would add that one of the themes I've been stressing, and I wrote a piece about this in National Review called What Jews Mean to America, is that it's important for us as Jewish Americans to not only fight anti-Semitism by speaking about our rights as Americans, though of course that would be totally legitimate. The case we have to be making is anti-Semites in America hate America. And they hate the Jews in part because of the way that the Hebrew biblical and, Jew, and in general, Jewish covenantal story has inspired America. They hate that about America itself. Um, and, and if you look at a, a, a pro-Israel rally, like the large Jewish rally that was in Washington, you will see American flags everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, a, a synagogue in Teaneck, New Jersey, hosted uh, not an IDF group, but a burial 
group, meaning a group of Jews from Israel that dedicate themselves to collecting the remains and burying terror victims. There was uh, a pro-Hamas protest outside the synagogue. The synagogue was was targeted for hosting a, a burial, a society of those that engage in the burial of terror victims. And then a counter rally was, was, took place among Teenex Jews. Only one of those rallies had American flags. Uh, only one of those groups were, was driven by a love for America and a deep sense of what makes America special. And so we Jews in America have to make that case about what the stakes are for this country. The story I told in the article, uh, story I, uh, 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 the story I told in the article is that I was interviewing uh, Natan Sharansky, the great uh, uh, Jew, a Jewish refusenik who was in uh, Soviet prison for a bunch of years. And I was interviewing him in Israel just recently. And I told him how I was struck by a scene on Jeopardy, the game show Jeopardy, uh, where you know you really have to be educated to be a contestant on Jeopardy, and there was a question or an answer on Jeopardy, uh, which was something like you know this, it is this biblical book that contains the verse though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil, and not a single one of the contestants knew what that book was. So seeing as how Nathan Sharansky's memoir was called Fear No Evil, <laughs> and it was about how the Psalms inspired him in prison and how he was also inspired by Ronald Reagan in the early 80s proclaiming the year, I think 1982, the year of the Bible. Maybe it was 83. So much so that his Bible study in prison was called Reaganite Readings. Um, So I asked him how he felt about this. So of course, first I had to explain to him what Jeopardy was and how it worked. That took took some time. But uh, the story he told me was about how in France, when he was the head of the uh, Jewish agency, which focuses on uh, facilitating uh, immigration to Israel, among other things, uh, when there was uh, an attack uh, on uh, Jewish, on a kosher butcher in France, uh, he asked the French philosopher, said Sharansky, he asked the French philosopher, Alain Finkelkraut, do you think there's a future for Judaism and for Jews in France? And Finkelkraut responded, the question is whether there's a future for France in France. Uh, and then Sharansky said to me, I would never until recently have asked that question about America. And then speaking about the self-hatred that he sees among some elite Americans, uh, he said he never thought this was possible before. And of course, this is, this is what's linked uh, to, uh, this, is, this is what's at stake. This is what's at stake. When Harry Truman was uh, uh, taken over to the White House and told that uh, FDR had, had died, he didn't Im- immediately realize what that meant for him, I think, and he, his first reaction was kindness. So he said to Eleanor Roosevelt, is there anything we can do for you? And she said, is there anything we can do for you? For you are the one who's in trouble now. Uh, and you know, it's, a, it's very, very meaningful for Jews to hear from other Americans that they are here for us. But it's we, all of us, as Americans that are in trouble. That's what Jews have to emphasize in America, I think. I could add just a bit to that. First of all, thank you. That was just very, very important. I think the the fact that pro-Israel Jews are so pro-American, I think can't be overstated. Um, And any rally you'll go to, you'll hear the the Star Spangled Banner song and so forth. and I think the anti-Semites are truly anti-American too. I, you know, even though they might say America first, I don't see love of country coming from that camp. So I think that just rec- recognition that they really are kind of jointly angry at America and Israel is, is important. Um, I also think that Judaism can offer something in America in this moment that I think that um, is another way of fighting back uh, to your question against anti-Semitism because I think that People hate Jews without any curiosity about Judaism beyond sort of like weird tropes that they might pick up on the internet. Um, But there's another article that I'm working on, which is about, it's tentatively titled, What Else Happened on October 7th? Um, October 7th was a religious holiday for Jews, a very joyous holiday in which people kind of celebrate the the Torah with dancing and song, and it's, it's really a beautiful day that I think that, it's the sort of thing that I think 
more Americans could come to appreciate not, not just that day on its own, but other things that I think could help supplement some of the, fray, the fraying social, social fabric in America, like the Jewish Sabbath. There are certain things that people are taking from the way that Jews observe Sabbath in terms of turning off their phones and gathering together as families. You know, there's digital Sabbath laws that are kind of gaining some currency in the policy world. Um, in Florida, they recently have, a, a, there, I think that uh, Ron DeSantis signed a bill putting some kind of curfew on social media and so forth. There are ideas that are being sort of pulled from certain Jewish practices. I think a better understanding of Judaism would also help to fray some of the worst anti-Semitic impulses, I would hope, anyway. Um, one more note I had. Well, thanks very much for those uh, very powerful answers. We'll throw it open now to the audience for, for questions. I think somebody has a, a microphone. So I'd like your um, comments on my thought that the core of anti-Semitism is really um, the fact that, and it's really kind of an extension of the reason of anti-Christian sentiment, is that the Jewish people have given us a code of ethics that you could say the capstone is the Ten Commandments that beyond all, for all you know, different reasons, the world has been looking to get rid of ever since that has been uh, proclaimed. And so I just am curious, you didn't bring that up at all, that that is, seems to be the prick that they can't get rid of. So, uh, of course, there's, there's great truth to what you're saying. But of course, uh, anti-Semitism existed in societies that embraced the Ten Commandments, uh, but either resented those who had given it uh, to them, uh, but, but uh, or, or or, uh, or, as I've suggested, uh, hated something else about the Jewish people as well. So uh, what, what you're mentioning harkens back to um, uh, the, the novel by Benjamin Disraeli, Tank Red. Uh, if you've, uh, uh, is it one of your favorite British prime ministers, uh, Disraeli, or no? Do you, do, uh, Carl, do you care to comment on... Uh, I'd be um, more of a Gladstone man. Oh, I'm sorry. This, this event is over. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it was Disraeli who was once asked to define the difference between a uh, misfortune and a tragedy. And I think he said that if Gladstone tripped and fell into the Thames, that would be a misfortune. But if someone pulled him out, that would be a tragedy. <laughs> uh, so, but if you've, uh, and I thought we were, we, we were getting along so swimmingly <laughs> until now. Uh, so, uh, but it's, there's a fascinating, strange, but fascinating novel by Disraeli called Tancred, which is about a uh, son of a duke who his parents wanted to go into parliament to prepare to become a duke. And uh, he instead journeys to the Holy Land because he's obsessed with trying to figure out as a Christian how this small people gave the West this, this code. And he actually ends up on Mount Sinai in this strange scene in the novel where he meets an angel and he wonders how he as, a, as a, an English Gentile aristocrat, he says, well, you know, what is he doing here? And then he says, well, he has a right to be here because every week in, in church, the lessons that came forth from this site uh, is you know is taught, and uh, so many of the groaning workers of the world get a rest once a week thanks to this site. And Disraeli was basically challenging a society where he still saw anti-Semitism to say, "But we gave this to you." <laughs> uh, now Disraeli's own co relationship with his Jewishness is complicated, um, but that's what Disraeli raises. Th so there is a part of that, but of course. Uh, anti-Semitism emerges in the West in its most fierce form. It, it existed before, of course, but in its most fierce form in a medieval society that embraced, in theory, the Ten Commandments. Uh, so it can't just be a hatred of the Ten Commandments. There's no question that part of some forms of anti-Semitism today are a resentment of the Jews for giving biblical ethics to the world. Uh, but the Jews were hated in biblically inspired societies as well. So ultimately, deep down, 
I think. The root is, uh, begins with what I described. Why are they still here? Or what I think uh, the, the writer Jonathan Rosenblum called uh, eternity envy. Uh, eternity envy. Uh, and what makes America unique is that from the very beginning, its founders, uh, rather than being envious of the Jewish story or seeking to pronounce themselves the new chosen people, uh, sought to learn from the biblical story. That's why one of the greatest and most remarkable American phrases is Lincoln's description of America as an almost chosen people, uh, which means on the one hand, it's not seeking to replace biblical Israel, but to learn from Israel's covenantal story. And also implicitly warning America that America will only be exceptional, so it's not guaranteed, it only will be exceptional so long as it lives up to its covenantal calling. I'll just add something very small to that. That was beautifully put. Um, but uh, Ruth Weiss, who is a great teacher of mine and um, a great Tikva personality, if anyone wants to explore some of her teachings on, on Tikva's website, um, she has often said that anti-Semitism tends not to flourish in healthy societies. Um, and I think that that is probably the truest, one of the truest things you can find. If something, if anti-Semitism is taking root, this is one of the reasons I find it alarming that it's happening in America because I don't think Americans are dispositionally anti-Semitic. Um, I would like to better understand what is the problem? What is so unhealthy about our society that people are latching on to this old, very adaptable sort of illness of the spirit? Um, and I think that that's, that's why I'm inclined to try to look under the cover and understand why um, and not give just a pad reason for it. I mean, you certainly did not do that, but that, that's, that's where my thinking is. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate it. Um, my question is um, just thinking about how anti-Semitism relates to America being coming more and more an anti-Christian nation as well. And, um, you know, Rosario Butterfield has written a book, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. Um, Aaron Wren has written um, Life in the Negative World. And just... Um, how much, you know, uh, there's just a lot of backlash and a lot of negativity towards anything that was sort of upheld before, right? Even even a, a pseudo-Christian kind of, um, of mentality. And so I think, you know, I mean, for me sitting here as a Christian, what I'm hearing you say as a Jewish person is to some extent what I think you know you're saying as an American. I think yeah. I mean that's what we're beginning, at least to some extent, to see and feel as Christians as well. And I'm just wondering if you could speak into that a little bit also as to how you see that relating. Um, the lack of religion in general to anti-Semitism. Well, just the, uh, the Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think that people are searching for meaning and maybe they think it's gauche or just untouchable to search for it in religion for whatever reason. They've been nihilism pilled or, so, or something. Um, so maybe part of their feeling of nihilism is in anger towards people who do find meaning in religion. The only reason I wonder about that is because I think people tend to just feel antipathy towards Jews, whether they're religiously observant Jews or not. Um, I don't think people, but it might be one strain of it, it might account for one strain of it, that there's a certain resentment towards um, Jewish Orthodox communities, which are really bulwarks against some of the worst of secular culture. Um, there's very close community ties. There's a lot of sort of warm, readily available hospitality. Um, it might be that envy is channel is is part of that, and maybe people are you're you're suggesting people are angry at Christians. Definitely, that is true in the academy. I would say, um, and that is a long-standing problem in in the U.S. as well. The you know, 
But I guess I'm more curious right now about the woke right and what's fueling them. But there is a post-Christian right that I think Christians are increasingly finding themselves at odds with. Um, but the weird thing about it is that I would say the post-Christian right includes a lot of people who would say that they're Christians, but they are engaging in some of the same stuff that like Andrew Tate, for example, is engaging with. They're finding a lot of common cause on Twitter with people who are seemingly entirely secular, at least in their conduct, but also hate Jews. So it's a very weird moment um, in terms of various figures online and how they position themselves religiously or whether they consider themselves pagan. Um, it's a good question. I don't know that I have a great answer for it. So I, I think absolutely uh, the rise of anti-Semitism is linked to uh, anti-biblical sentiment uh, in, in certain circles. There's no question about it. Uh, because whereas, of course, there were biblically inspired medieval societies and post-medieval societies that were anti-Semitic, uh, as, I, as, I, as I said, what, what marked America as unique is the way it saw itself as a covenantal people, uh, which you can only understand in terms of the role that the Bible played in American political culture. Uh, Rabbi Sachs, the way Rabbi Sachs put it was, as he said, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, Carl, actually, uh, as an immigrant uh, to America, uh, the, um, uh, um, you're, uh, you're, you're a citizen now, right? Or I don't mean to put you on the spot. That's, uh, that's, uh, I, I'm is that a, a sensitive question? Or citizen of two Earth are, you are, You are a citizen. You're a citizen, not in the words of Sting, a legal alien in New York, right? Uh, I, I to use one of his basketball. songs. Yes, I okay. have an American So, basketball. Rabbi Sachs, uh, so you're in the great words of the movie Toy Story, one of us, one of us. Yeah. Yeah. Not one of them, uh, but one of so, you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. We really gave it to, that Brit to those British people at Yorktown, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I meant that to be a, you know, uniting, you know. Wait, you're referring to the, the illegal colonial rebellion, yeah, I yeah, presume, at this point. Well, it's it's uh, one of my uh, wonderful friends, the historian Andrew Roberts, who actually just wrote a book about George III. Uh, when I took him to uh, introduce him to my synagogue, I told him the story of our synagogue and their activity in the uh, in the American Revolution. Um, uh, and he knows I'm an I'm 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 an Anglophile <laughs> in many ways. So um, and so, uh, and I said to him that there were very few members of the synagogue that were loyalists. Uh, and I said, but you know, there were a few, and they have descendants in the synagogue, but they were hiding it, you know. But I've exposed it, you know. And Andrew said something like, "There's nothing to expose. They should be proud. They were great patriots, right, <laughs> or something like that." Anyhow, but what Rabbi Sachs noted was as follows: He came to America and he visited Washington D.C. and he was struck by the fact that at uh, if you go to the memorials for American figures, uh, what you see is. Uh, th that uh, th that uh, they don't just have statues of these figures, they have words, the great ideas that they said. You see the Gettysburg Address uh, inscribed uh, at the, uh, on the Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial on the Declaration and so forth. And he says, England has nothing like this. He says, if, if the memorial for David Lloyd George has three words, David Lloyd and George. <laughs> uh, and Churchill's memorial just has Churchill, even though words were kind of important for for Churchill. Um, and he said the answer is, he says, that the way he put it was Britain at least used to be a tradition-based society. Those who knew belonged and those who didn't know showed that they didn't belong. Uh, and he said in America, this is Rabbi Sachs, this is, none of this is me. He says in America it's a covenantal society dedicated to ideas. Right? And, and by the way, you see this everywhere. Still, there are still, um, if you travel to Washington DC, souvenirs will be like, Declaration ties, right? Will there be ties? If you fly to London, you tell me no one's selling, you know, replicas of the Magna Carta. Uh, <laughs> on, uh, you know, someone gave me a, a mug from Kensington Palace uh, souvenir shop, which had on it uh, Henry VIII and his six wives pictures. And when you pour hot water into the into the cup, the six wives disappear. <laughs> you know. So those are. And, but you have to be an outsider sometimes to see it. Sometimes to see it. And now, all my jokes aside about the American Revolution, there's of course so much that's remarkable about England, and there's so much about England to which American political culture is deeply indebted. Uh, but 
Well, this covenantal culture is what makes America unique. And the reason why Franklin suggested that the seal of the United States be Israel, the splitting of the sea, the reason why Jefferson suggested that the seal of the United States be Israel in the wilderness following a, pill, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, is because they, they understood, not because they were super religious, but because they understood the way Americans saw themselves. And this is throughout much of American public life. And that means, of course, and that's why, by the way, the modern state of Israel and its story, its miraculous story, is such a source of inspiration to Americans that still remain biblically inspired. Um, uh, and that, of course, so of course, anti-Semites understand that the Jewish story is linked to the way a, biblical, a biblically inspired America sees itself. And that's at the heart of a lot of what's driving uh, anti-Semitic sentiment in America now. Yeah, it's an interesting observation on the difference between uh, England and, and America. I, I, I'm not quite sure I can fully articulate this, but I've said this to students before, that the striking thing about America is anybody can become an American. Yeah. If an, I've got American friends who moved to England and, and took out British citizenship, but in my mind, they're Americans who hold British passports. I will never consider them to be truly English, not in a racist way or anything like that, but England's not an idea in a way that America is kind of an idea. And that's what, you, to go back to a comment you made earlier about the 1619 Project, again, I've commented to students in class on this, what interests me about that is not, it's not the historical debates about whether it's accurate or not, it's the fact that it exists at all. The fact that it exists tells me that a nation that is really an idea seems no longer to agree on what that idea is. And that places America, I think, in a very precarious and dangerous situation at this point in time when a nation no longer knows who and what she is. All kinds of evils arise or, or emerge from the fault lines of which anti-Semitism, I think, might, might well be perhaps the most prominent at this point in time. We've probably got time, I think, for, for one more question. So that I don't take responsibility, I'll let the, the lady with the microphone choose. <laughs> you have been chosen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Uh, they were remarkable, I, and your humor, too. Uh, I, just a quick comment, I'm, and then a question. Uh, the comment is that, as a conservative Christian, I find I have far more in common with an Orthodox Jew now than I do with liberal Christians. There are a spectrum of issues that I'd cite to, you know, abortion rights, uh, trans, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, there's kind of a unique, this is a unique moment, and I'm wondering if it's a watershed moment. And my real, my, the point of my question is, do you think that there is a historic transition possible politically so that Jews will begin to navigate more readily toward conservative politicians moving forward? I'm not necessarily talking about 2024, but beyond. Is it a watershed mo moment politically, do you think? Well, after you, I'm happy, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah, well, I'm happy to, but, but if you'd like um, to go first. Well, yeah. I'll follow up, I'll follow up. Okay. Well, I should mention that yeah. my grandmother was British, though, before we move forward. Oh. So I have a lot of British gotcha. relatives. Now, yes. did he prefer Gladstone or Disraeli? <laughs> my grandmother? I should ask my uncle, my great uncle. Yeah. <laughs> that, that reminds me, by the way, once we're talking about English things, and we'll get back to the question. Uh, when I took a tour of England, I think it was at Runnymede, uh, where the Magna Carta was signed, and then we had a, a, a wonderful guide, lovely guide, and I'm I'm actually, I love English history and I read it as a hobby and I'm deeply interested in it. And I've taught a course on Anglo-Jewish history called Rabbis and Lords. So it's, it's a source of actually, all jokes aside, something that I, I, I'm, I, I deeply love learning about and speaking about and I'm, I, I read royal biographies as a hobby. So I said to the guide, I said, uh, uh, Richard, uh, uh, um, 
uh, you know, who are your favorite English kings? So he said something like, and I apologize for my terrible English accent, but he said something like, oh, I, I prefer some of the lesser well-known ones, such as uh, uh, Edward from the 13th century. And I said, oh, Edward Longshanks, who expelled the Jews in 1290? Uh, and there's, there's a silence, and then he goes, right, we'll take him off the list then. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, so, um, my own view on on this is um, there really isn't because uh, I get a lot of questions about Jews and voting, and while of course it's easy to make, there are exceptions to every generalization. The fact is, it's not Jewish voting. By and large, matches up with with. Uh, many if not most Christian demographics in America, by which I mean that the greatest predictor of how one votes is often linked to things like regularity of attending house of worship. Okay, so of course, Jews picks out, it's both, it's, it picks out an, a larger ethnicity within America, and it, Judaic, picks out a religious, and Jewish often picks out a religious aspect. And so uh, how, how the current moment will be reflected in Jewish voting uh, in 2024 is, I think, a very interesting question um, in the moment. And there are moments in history where you see shifts among Jews in general. So there was such a moment between Carter and Reagan uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, in, 19, in 1980. But in general, and, and maybe there will be a shift that will mark it, but the question I get, indeed the, the title of uh, the book of a dear friend of mine, Why Are Jews, uh, uh, the Norman Podhoritz's book, Why Are Jews Liberals? Um, the answer by and large is today is that, uh, is that sociologically, uh, voting by and large matches up with a uh, level of Jewish uh, tradition and religiosity, much as it will with, uh, with uh, many Christian demographics in America. That's just a sociological fact. Um, yeah, so I think that's totally right. Um, I went to a modern Orthodox girls high school, which means that it was an Orthodox Jewish high school that was not what you might consider ultra-Orthodox, which is like the people you see on TV, which have, you know, full black hats, long beards, and all the rest of it. It's, it's we are, whatever. One of the kinds of orthodoxy is that you might see more often and not realize that they're orthodox. But um, we would have mock elections in school, well over 90% voted Republican, basically in every single such election and so forth. So uh, a lot of the most right-wing religious people are very conservative politically. Um, and for the rest of the Jews out there, I think that it's an interesting question because there's an interesting opportunity here, I think maybe for Jews, to try to push their co-religionists to wake up a little bit um, and rethink their commitments and their approach to politics. Because I think a lot of people just sort of think that being liberal means being a good person. It means being nice. It means not being racist. It means whatever you know they, they might think. And now all of a sudden it's like, if they, if they truly realize that being liberal has deep, you know, areas of bigotry embedded in it. I, you know, it might be a wake up moment, but I think that Jews on the right ought to take advantage of it to try to push, um, yeah, to push their co-religionists a little bit into, I would, I would argue, a saner, polit you know, political camp. Well, I'll draw things to a close there. I just want to say it's been tremendous privilege and a pleasure to chair the panel with the two of you. I personally could sit and listen to you both for hours. And Solly, you might want to think of a career as a stand-up comedian as well. You <laughs> definitely have that, uh, that touch uh, to it's you. It's plan C after uh, <laughs> sushi chef is number two. If, uh, if the rabbit it doesn't pan out. But I think this is a, an extremely important topic. I think it's going to remain an important topic. I think we have two of the most uh, sobering and intelligent uh, voices on that topic on the panel here today. I wonder if you would join me in expressing appreciation. <laughs>